to um, sort of regain its own citizenship in the face of white America, in the face of the state. Um, but you have this subgroup of, of uh, no-no boys, the people who are in Thule Lake, or the draft resistors, who are ostracized from an ostracized community. And it's just heartbreaking, this book. And it's beautiful. And to me, it's still the best book you know, uh, in Asian American literature. And I, that's the reason we named the Project Nona Boy, so people would Google Nona Boy and buy the book. Um, <laughs> so if you haven't read it, please do. Uh, buy our book first. <laughs> then buy John O'Connor. Um, but there's just this, this haze and this fog this torn into itness that I think, you know, obviously is exacerbated when you're someone like a refugee or you're resettling like so many people did in Chicago after the camps. Um, but for a lot of us immigrant kids or, or, or immigrants who come, you know, even from European countries, uh, which don't have that same kind of um, twist to it, uh, there's always a torn into itness, whether it's language or your food being weird all these little things, and that's something that's really lovely and hard and beautiful to explore in songwriting, and, and that's what this next song does. It's called Pacific Flag, uh, finally recorded and available in the <laughs>
mostly about a backyard barbecue, just sort of hanging out with your friends. Um, but the photographs in it, I think, make you think a little bit more about you know the characters you see in your head when you think about who's having a backyard barbecue in the U.S. Um, and this photograph that we start with is probably my favorite in our whole show because this is my grandfather um, who grew up on a pineapple plantation on Maui. Um, and this is a photo of him right before he got his Eagle Scout in high school. Um, and I'd never seen this photo before June when we went out to Hawaii for some research. And my auntie had this amazing folder, just manila folder, with all these photographs of my grandfather and his eight siblings as kids doing, you know, hiking and hanging out with their parents and fishing and things like that. And these photos I'd never seen. I just thought of my grandfather as this kind of stoic, tall man who always walked with his hands behind his back, um, who served in the military and didn't really talk about his time with the 442nd, but you know, we found his Purple Heart and all of his medals in an envelope in a sock drawer when he passed away. Just a very humble, quiet, strong guy. Uh, but seeing this photograph sort of added a dimension to him, added a dimension to so many of his siblings and these folks who, whose childhoods you forget happened, whose childhoods were taken from them. Um, and this next song, you know, we ask you to kind of think about that. It's called Disposable Youth and thinking about what happens when you have <coughs> histories of violence and war and trauma and displacement and what happens to the kids. <coughs> Sleeves. 
And a big reason when we talk about the Japanese American population, why citizenship was regained. Um, fully, how, uh, you know, sort of um, the idea of loyalty through service uh, coming about. And that was a really dominant narrative in American history and the J community uh, for a long time, sort of excluding the Nono voice and a lot of these other stories that did not fit neatly um, into that population's. Uh, journey through the camps and then resettlement back home for a lot of people. This next song sort of honors people like parents' granddad, um, but also begs us to ask the question of what is the project of history? Um, what is it actually doing to remember? And when you remember, who are you remembering? Um, and it was inspired by going sort of beneath the memorials, beneath the pilgrimages that we've been to to these camps, beneath uh, the history books, and, and really searching deep into the archives. And some of the most fascinating and haunting articles that we've found have been of the suicides in the Japanese American incarceration camps. Like 61-year-old Tomoki Ogata, who was a Issei, came over when he was a young man. And by the time he was turning 60, Pearl Harbor had been bombed prejudice, economic jealousy, all these other reasons. Uh, he found himself in a concentration camp in Colorado. He lost everything like all these other people. But he really lost everything. Because in this one little article that we found, it's a 61-year-old Issei bachelor found hanging after three weeks. So this is a guy who in Amache, Colorado, comes back from a work leave, takes a rope, walks three miles, rope in hand, through this sagebrush ground, finds a tree, probably cottonwood, along the Arkansas River, takes the time to put that rope over the tree, tie it off, and hang himself. And we sing a lot of songs about young love in camp, um, about bands, both in the camps, as well as in the Vietnamese diaspora, in wars, people making the best and surviving the situation. But it's really important to remember the people who don't survive these situations and what that means to the overall history. Because a lot of times when you go to an archive and you look up oral histories, those are people who lived. And those are people who can talk about this stuff. A lot of people can't talk about it. A big part of this project for us is because of the silences of our own families and filling in those gaps. And so, Tomoki Ogata is hanging for three weeks while dances are happening, while bands are playing, while people are falling in love, holding hands under the soapy water. This is happening at once, and this is the project of history. This juxtaposition, this duality, or multiplicity, really. And so, this song um, takes a very common refrain that Japanese Americans know, only what you can carry, and sort of asks us to apply it as people who have histories, which we can or can't carry with us. It's also a very graphic image um, that you'll see, so if you feel free to close your eyes for this song. I wrote to the poet, Brandon Shimoda, about the ones we leave behind. Alone on the plains, lost to muted refrains in dust devil sagebrush shrines. Traipsing through that museum out in Los Angeles, I'm floating past history without a stumble or trip. I see a boy scout, a bass drum, and a we got through this narrative real life. From an exhibition script, only what you can carry. Take only what you can carry. But I think of Tomoki Ogata picking out a tree, and I think of Mr. Horada. Just hanging from a barrack beam. But 
take only what you can get. I was talking to my friend Aronawi Young about her granddad's purple heart. Catching a bullet, proving some metal, and saving our world from falling apart. Then my ears caught the roar of a thousand men or more marching with the Hoshida. They sang those Issei songs you won't hear anymore, scraped from loyal American tongues, only what you can carry. Only what you And I think of Frances Okasaki When did her daughter realize she was gone? And I think of John Yoshida Laying down on the railroad track to join his mom But take only what you can carry I would but ask you one question, simple and true, and there is no right answer I expect back from you, but when we remember, really what do we do, who do we save, and who do we lose, I think of those granddads in the 442, and their names held forever, So scrawled out in some reds, whites, and blues. <coughs> There's Francis Okasaki, and this poor John Yoshida, and Mr. Harada. It's a monkey or god. But take only what you can carry. Only what you can carry. Only what you.